there, well, there, thanks, hi, whatever. Um, they're at uh, Middlesbrough Community Church this morning, which is part of our Taking Ground churches. And uh, so, yeah, so that's where they are. But uh, Matt, can I just pray for you as, uh, as you uh, speak to us this morning? That Lord, we just... We want to pray. We, we're speaking about anointed messengers. Well, first of all, Lord, we pray for your anointing right now on Matt. Lord, fill him with your spirit. We thank you, God, that you are moving uh, among us this morning. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is speaking to us this morning. And I pray for us as a congregation that our hearts may be open to hear your words, but also to hear your challenge as well. Because, Lord, we want to be transformed by your gospel. So anoint this man to share the word of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. yeah, it's very tempting to keep his phone then and see what we might do with it during the service, but no, let's get on with the word of God, shall we? Yeah, so um, my title this morning, let's just go straight there. My title this morning is Anointed Messengers Live Adventurously. I'm going to be talking about adventure this morning that comes with the anointing of following Jesus. And uh, it's fair to say that if you've been uh, with us over the last few weeks and as we've been going through this series in Acts, looking at what it means to be an anointed messenger, it's been one of sort of incredible action, adventure, of growth. And if you haven't been with us uh, for the last few weeks, here's a little bit of a of a highlight reel, if you like. So some verses that just sort of characterize what's been going on uh, in the beginning of the church life. So uh, right at the beginning of Acts, Jesus returns to heaven and he gives this commission to his disciples. He says, you'll receive power. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And as we go through Acts 2, we see the Holy Spirit being poured out. Uh, Peter preaches, and it says in verse uh, 41 of that, of that chapter that about 3,000 were added to that number just on that day. Later on in, in chapter 2, it says the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. When we go into chapter 3, we start seeing some incredible healing miracles. And people are filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Uh, even in, uh, in the context of Peter and John being arrested for what had happened because the religious teachers didn't like their teaching, chapter 4 tells us that still many who heard their message believed. In chapter 5, we see even more healings and acts of Holy Spirit power. Verse 14 of chapter 5 says, more and more Men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Chapter 6, the number of disciples was continue, continuing to increase. And verse 7 of chapter 6 says, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. We've just seen chapter after chapter after chapter of increase of this Holy Spirit being poured out on the church in Jerusalem. And what results is growth and belief and disciples. And last week, uh, Matt Horner spoke to us out at the beginning of chapter 6. Uh, he was talking about the need for everyone to play their part as the, as the church was growing. They were tackling some practical problems, and particularly in that context, it was about distribution of food to, to widows. But, um, and this was all about how, to, how the church was learning to facilitate the growth that it, uh, that it was experiencing. And in that context, seven people, seven people were particularly chosen to oversee that ministry, that oversee that daily distribution of food. And they were chosen not because they were sort of really gifted in, you know, cutting slices of bread really neatly so everybody got a fair share. No, they were chosen because they were full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. And what we're going to look at today is how two of them, specifically uh, Stephen and Philip, ended up doing far more than serving food. Now, I have a challenge this morning because Matt finished somewhere in the middle of chapter 6. I've got to get us to the middle of chapter 8. Thanks, Matt. Actually, he didn't put together the series. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it's not his fault either. But we need some context. What's, what happens between uh, this passage last week when Matt was talking about seven men being chosen to distribute food 
and where we're going to today in terms of anointed messengers living adventurously. Well, when things go well, inevitably other people get jealous. I guess we don't like to think about that in ourselves, but I suspect all of us can acknowledge at times when things go well for other people, jealousy might spring up in our heart, a little bit of envy about why it's going so well. Well, this church that's starting in Jerusalem is going very, very, very well. And the Jewish leaders, who are used to being the ones that kind of control the religious narrative, they're, they're in charge of what goes on in the temple. They're the ones who are top dogs around here. Well, they start feeling a bit jealous because they're not living under the same anointing. They're not seeing the same kind of dynamic growth and life that these Christians are experiencing. And specifically, they start to get really jealous of Stephen, one of those seven guys who was chosen last week. Again, not because he was really good at cutting bread or slicing up portions of food and distributing them, but because where he went, when he prayed for people, the Holy Spirit did some amazing things. When he opened his mouth, he just spoke with incredible wisdom. And they'd try and take him on and ask him some questions, and his wisdom just confounded them. You know, it's really annoying when you have a conversation with someone, and they're just really clever. <laughs> and every time you try and trip them up, it's like, oh. Well, that's what's going on with these religious leaders. They're just, they're just falling over their own attempts to trip him up. So they create some false charges. If we can't trip him up, we'll work out how we can arrest him and get rid of him. And they arrested Stephen at the end of uh, chapter 6. And what we, you need to go away and you need to read chapter 7, because I'm not going to do it for you today. But chapter 7 is one of the most incredible speeches or preaches that you will read in Scripture as Stephen, as he's uh, had all these accusations thrown at him as, as the religious leaders are really trying to shut down the church. He stands up and he gives them a whole complete explanation of God's working through the history of the people of Israel and how it culminates in Jesus being the Messiah that they were all looking for. And I'm going to start reading at the end of chapter 7. I'm going to read from uh, verse 57 of chapter 7 and into uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, because this is what happened after Stephen had preached. It says, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. And Saul approved of their killing him. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. What? Hang on, this was going really well. When Peter stood up in chapter 2, 3,000 people get born again. Seems a bit unfair on Stephen. He's anointed with the Holy Spirit. He stands up. He gives an incredible sermon and ends up being stoned. And the church scattered. You know, this is the first time in Scripture that the Bible uses specifically uses the word persecution against Christians. This isn't just opposition. This isn't just jealousy rising up. This isn't people trying to trip them up put them in prison for a little while, they can work out what they can charge them with. Now this is persecution. This is genuine risk and fear of death. And the church scatters from Jerusalem. It says all except the apostles were scattered. All, the thousands that have been added to their number, ran. It says they went through Judea and Samaria. I've got a little map just to give you a bit of an illustration of what that looks like. Uh, Jerusalem there is circled in yellow. Well, Judea is that kind of gray area around Jerusalem. Samaria is that red area. Put yourself back into the first century. You've got no cars, no trains, no buses. You've got no phones, no communication, 
and you're scattered over a radius here of about 50, 60, 70 miles, okay? What was a community within a city really is now a scattered community across a very wide area. And they're fleeing from prison and from death. Many of them find themselves in Samaria. What, what's special about Samaria? Well, Samaria would not have been a place of welcome for them. Uh, Jews and Samaritans had a shared history uh, until about uh, 1,000 to 700 years before Jesus came when the nation of Israel split. And those in the northern half of Israel uh, went away from the traditions that Jews had followed and became known as Samaritans because of the area that they lived in, but actually had changed many of the traditions of their faith. And, you know, if you remember Jesus telling the story of the Good Samaritan, why was it such a shock that the Samaritan was the good one? Well, because in Jewish culture, Jews and Samaritans didn't mix. There was this enmity almost between people who'd been brothers previously. And so for these new Jewish Christians to be scattered, not only through Judea, but then into Samaria, suddenly meant that a number of them were finding themselves in a place that they really would never have cho chosen to go to. You would far rather walk around Samaria than walk through it if you were a Jew. And yet, this is where they ended up uh, going. Now, how would you feel? How would you feel in that kind of scenario? Everything, everything is going so well. God's clearly on our side, and then something happens, and <laughs> what's going on? Um, what's it like to find yourself suddenly in a place where you're not really very welcome? A number of, well, say a number of years ago, I'll tell you obviously, I, when I went to university, in fact, I, like most students, uh, got placed in a hall of residence. And about a month before uh, I left home for my first term at university, uh, I got a letter that was jointly sent by the university and the local police basically saying, you're in this hall of residence, uh, but the other side of the road to where you'll be living is an estate where we've had some trouble. And we've had some trouble specifically between residents who live there and students. And so it's our very, very, very strong advice that you don't walk through that estate, even though it might be quicker for you to go where you're going for your own well-being and just to let things ease down, please don't. So obviously my parents were delighted at where I was about to move to and, uh, and off I went. And actually, do you know what? There was a road that I could walk down and we could walk down and you generally didn't need to go into that estate. So it wasn't a problem. Move on to the end of my degree and I went and did uh, teacher training. I stayed on to do teacher training and I had two placements. One was in a very nice school uh, for three weeks and then my second placement was in the secondary school right in the middle of this estate. And so every morning for 12 weeks, I, as the student teacher, had to walk through this estate to the school where I was going to teach. And so I know how unwelcome <laughs> it, you can feel walking through that. Everything in me wanted to hide the fact that I was a student teacher, but if you've ever seen a student teacher, you just know they're a student teacher, don't you? <laughs> you know, whether you're a pupil, a parent, or another teacher, student teachers stand out. There's something in me that I couldn't hide about myself, however much I tried. For these guys living scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, I wonder how they felt. I wonder whether they were Tempted to give up on it all. We've had a good ride. That was fun. But maybe it's time to give up. Maybe it's time just to settle back into our Jewish patterns of life. Maybe it's time just to be silenced because who knows who might be listening. And sooner or later, maybe that persecution will reach us. You know, they had a huge choice as to how they were going to live. And as the title of my talk suggests this morning, they made a choice to live adventurously. And so we're going to read uh, from verse 4 of chapter 8 through to verse 25, and we're going to see 
what happened with those scattered Christians. So verse 4, and this will come up on the screen for you to follow. So those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and pro- proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in that city and amazed all the people in Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And after they had proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. I want to suggest three things to you this morning about living adventurously. Firstly, that it involves obeying the command of Jesus. Secondly, that it involves proclaiming the name of Jesus, and thirdly, that it involves living for the fame of Jesus. So first of all, what does obeying the command of Jesus look like? You know, I think for all the fear that those uh, Christians might have experienced fleeing Jerusalem, somehow the words of the Lord Jesus must have still been ringing in their ears, right? Back from Acts chapter 1. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know, when Matt was preaching last week, one of his points was about a problem becoming an opportunity. Might have been one of my points this morning, if, I, if he hadn't said it so well last week. <laughs> but actually, here, they didn't see their scattering as the end of something, merely a new opportunity to continue what had already started. You know, we don't get to choose everything that happens to us, do we? We don't get to make a choice about all of our circumstances, but we do get to choose our response to our circumstances. And those disciples who scattered far and wide from Jerusalem chose to continue to be obedient to the command of Jesus. They chose to continue to witness about him wherever they went. And the the passage we read highlights specifically about Philip, but actually it's not restricted to Philip. It talks about all of them, wherever they went. Uh, Peter and John come and see what's going on, and as they return, they return through all the villages of Samaria and Judea back to Jerusalem, continuing to preach about the word of, uh, about Jesus. They definitely didn't do everything they could to hide their identity like I did as a student teacher, Here were a group of Christians who understood their identity and realized that wherever they were and whatever their circumstances, they were called to be witnesses. And they made sure that they were obedient. 
have a question for you this morning. What does obeying that command of Jesus look like where you live? Maybe there are aspects of the community that you live in or aspects of your workplace that you really don't like and don't enjoy. Maybe there are aspects that, in which you choose to hide. There's a challenge this morning as we look at how these uh, disciples respond, say, maybe I need to look again at how I'm being obedient to the command of Jesus, where I live, where I work, where I spend my time. Secondly, this morning, living adventurously is about proclaiming the name of Jesus. Uh, Verse 4 of chapter 8 says, Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. Verse 12 says, When they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Preaching, proclaiming, evangelizing, whatever word you choose to read or is used here in the scripture basically means they talked. I'm sure there were some occasions where some of those who were a bit more bold and courageous than others did stand up in a marketplace, did go to a temple and preach to a few people. But I suspect there were an awful lot of people who turned up in villages and just told their story. They just talked. They just talked about what Jesus has done. That's what it means to proclaim the name of Jesus, to tell your story of what Jesus has done in your life. And for them, it was an incredible story of transformation, of power and challenge, and yet they still were there proclaiming the name of Jesus. We had um, the three lads who were here from as part of the Texan team staying with us um, last week. And when they uh, came back to our house for the first time on that Tuesday evening, their afternoon had been spent in South Bank uh, giving out leaflets and advertising the Open Well. And it was just wonderful. They said, well, so we started giving out leaflets and talking to people. And then people were really keen to hear about Jesus. So we talked about Jesus. And then in the end, we talked about Jesus, and then we kept remembering that we had to give them a flyer. They had just loved the experience of going into a completely different community and talking about Jesus. And do you know what? People were open to, open to hearing what they had to say. How much do we talk about Jesus? Some of you talk about Jesus an awful lot. I know. And some of us actually maybe are quite quiet about Jesus and the impact that he's had on our lives. I want to challenge us this morning that there's some adventure to have when we proclaim the name of Jesus, when we speak the name of Jesus, when we just tell our stories in the communities we find ourselves in. There's a question for you again this morning. What does proclaiming the name of Jesus look like where you live? What does it look like where you work? Pause for a moment. Think about it. Where are the people that you connect with most often? What would it look like for you to talk about Jesus? with them. Maybe that fills you with a bit of a sense of fear. Maybe this passage challenges you and excites you about the opportunities that might open up when you take a brave step. But adventure with Jesus comes as we proclaim his name. And thirdly this morning, living adventurously is living for the fame of Jesus. I was very grateful for what Sue kind of prophesied to us this morning about taking nothing of the glory of God. But we read this story in the middle of chapter 8 about this guy called Simon who's a sorcerer and a bit of a local celebrity. He's a kind of, somehow a kind of cross between Gandalf and David Blaine or something. (laughs) He's he's obviously got something going on and and actually he's he's a bit of a star. So, you know, rich, poor, people are attracted to him. They're gathering around him. And so much so, they go as far as saying this man is rightly called the great power of God. I mean, they, had, they have put him on a pedestal. But what does Philip do? Actually, he seems to pretty much just ignore him. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in your fame, in your celebrity. What I'm interested in is the fame and the glory of God. Philip gets on and preaches the word of God. 
And what happens? Well, do you know what? The glory of God is bigger than the glory of Simon. There's a surprise. The glory of God is bigger than the glory of Simon. Things that are happening because Philip is filled with the Holy Spirit are far more powerful, far more attractive, far more exciting. The words that Philip is is speaking are far more filled with truth and hope and life than anything Simon's doing. And so heads are turned. And Simon over here, saying, hang on, I'm, I'm the big chief around here. Philip comes on and says, no, no, God's the big chief around here. This is about his glory and his fame. And actually Simon himself, it says, turns and chooses to believe himself. For those of us who live, seek to live adventurously for God, we live not for our fame, not for our glory, but for the glory and the fame of Jesus. You know, we don't hear about Simon the sorcerer again. But next week, you're going to hear more about Philip and the adventures that he has with God. And through Acts, people come and people go, but the glory of God continues. And that's our story as we see 2,000 years later, people come and people go, but the glory and fame of Jesus keeps increasing. Why? Because it's all his. It's all about him. And people who live for the glory of fame of Jesus God can use them to have an adventure. Question for you. What does living for the fame of Jesus look like where you live? Maybe there's some people around you who seemingly far more attractive, far more popular, grab far more attention than you. Well, it's not about you anyway. But what would the glory and fame of Jesus look like where you live and where you work? Maybe uh, you're sitting here this morning and thinking, this adventure thing, it's not really me. It doesn't sound like me. I'm not quite like that. I kind of want to make a point that that's probably actually completely true. Because it isn't about us. It's all about God. It's all about his Holy Spirit. I'm here this morning not to kind of excite us about an adventure but actually to bring us back to the anointing of the Holy Spirit because that's where it all begins that's where it started uh, in Acts chapter 2 as the Holy Spirit was poured out Peter was enabled to preach people believed how were miracles performed in chapter 3 4 5 because the Holy Spirit was poured out how is Stephen empowered with such wisdom and miraculous power and able to speak because he's filled with the Holy Spirit What is it that makes these disciples who were scattered so bold, so brave to live adventurously for Jesus? It's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, uh, there is an adventure for us. Again, Sue sort of of prophesied this, but this this is a continual sound that we are hearing, that there is an adventure for us in growth as a church. There is a Community after community across Teesside that God desires to become famous in. And he wants to become famous through the work that he's called us to, along with plenty of other churches as well. But there's something that we need to step into. And where does it start? Yeah, you're all great. (laughs) But greater because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And as I finish this morning, I want to finish not with a call to adventure, but to a call for fresh anointing. Who wants to live under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Who wants to uh, live empowered to obey the command of Jesus? To live empowered to proclaim the name of Jesus? To live empowered for, for the fame of Jesus? I do. And if you do too, maybe you just want to stand with me. We're going to worship again, but we're going to pray. Chapter 7 is a bit of a blip in the book of Acts, if you like, in terms of the church growing. But it continues to grow in chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10. 
chapter 8 is a passage where God's passion for people beyond Jerusalem starts to be uh, outworked as the church is scattered into, uh, into Judea and into Samaria. But God's vision was never just for Jerusalem, it was never just for Judea, it was never just for Samaria, it was for the ends of the earth. And where do we live? Well, somewhere near the end. It's a sphere, isn't it? It doesn't really have beginnings and ends. You know, we still have the same mandate to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so we need to receive power. So why don't you just stretch out your hands if you want to receive something from the Lord today of an anointing to be an effective witness for him wherever you live. Say, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you delight to empower the church for the work of the mission of Jesus. And so this morning we want to receive a fresh anointing. A fresh anointing that takes us to a place of adventure that's all about you. That's all about uh, the ability to obey, the ability to proclaim, and the willingness to live completely for your glory and your fame. And so we ask now that for each of us that you would anoint us for the task that you've called us to, that we would be witnesses wherever you have put us, whether we choose to be there or we'd rather not, whether people look at us with smiles or with scowls. Lord, would we be witnesses wherever we live, we pray. As we worship you, would we glorify you? We continue to live for your glory and we will walk out of here empowered for the week that you have ahead of us. Empowered to be witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen.